Well, thank you so much for inviting me tonight. Thank you for taking your time out uh, on a night like tonight. Um, I really appreciate uh, that effort. And I hope tonight to really challenge you to, to think about this whole area of our world around us and seeing how our faith and the science that goes around conservation can work together to help us care for God's world and to really love God and love our neighbor. Um, I did uh, study at University of Miami. I grew up in the north and sort of went south. And as soon as I visited in Miami in April after living in Detroit, I decided that was the place for me uh, to be able to study marine biology. And as I progressed through, through university, I was able to uh, begin to study coral reefs. And, um, you know, not every uh, field trip and not every work that a marine biologist does is on some beautiful beach in some beautiful place. It, it can be a lot of hard work and a lot of cold and a lot of rough seas and a lot of uh, vomiting, uh, being seasick. Uh, Ask me later about vomiting underwater. It's not pleasant, but I have done that. Um, but this was one of those times, <laughs> I don't think too much about it. This was one of those times where I was uh, helping to study a marine protected area, kind of a coral reef park in the Bahamas. And it was one of those days where it was, you know, 80 degrees out, so it wasn't too hot, wasn't too cold. And we're skimming along the water, this beautiful crystal clear water in the Bahamas. Uh, our job, I, people would always ask me, what did I do for my PhD? And I said, I count fish. And they said, yeah, right, well, what do you really do? And, and really, I did just count fish. Um, and so, but I could almost count them from the boat. You know, the water was so clear. And so uh, it was our job to uh, study this area. We were looking for uh, these big fish called grouper. If you've ever eaten one, they're very tasty. And, uh, and because of that, not very common anymore in the Caribbean. But we were in this marine protected area trying to understand whether this park was actually protecting the fish or not. So my buddy and I, we, we uh, go down underwater and, you know, like all scientists, we're more concerned about the data than safety. And so we just sort of wave to each other and he goes off on his way and I go off on my way. And so the way you're not supposed to scuba dive but we are out uh, in an area called the Tongue of the Ocean. And so it's, um, and it's about, you swim along the bottom of the ocean at about 80, uh, 90 feet, and then you get to an edge and it drops down to about 3,000, 4,000 feet deep. And so you go down this wall and you can't go that deep, obviously, with, with normal scuba diving gear. But so I was down about maybe 100, 120 feet. And we had a clipboard with underwater paper and just a normal pencil and taking notes, counting fish. And so I'm hanging out there in the middle of the, of the ocean, basically alone, my buddy somewhere off where I can't see him. And I, you know, all of this deep water behind me and underneath me, and every once in a while you get this sort of feeling like, hmm, I'm not so sure. What, something, something's around. And so, you know, it's just sort of, you get that prickling at the back of your neck. And one of those times I looked down and could kind of, kind of see in the deep water and I saw a little spot down there. And I was like, I wonder what that is. And so I kept my eye on it. And then I noticed it was getting bigger and it was getting bigger. And then it shot right past me. And I was trying to go around and look and see what it was. And it was a huge barracuda, about six feet long. And barracudas have this unnerving habit, habit. They have these big mouths with big teeth, and they have really big eyes. And they, he was staring me right in the face, opening, you know, they're using their mouth just to breathe. And so he got these big teeth going like this. And for a second, I was, of course, scared. Uh, and then I realized, okay, it's a barracuda. It's not going to eat me. It's clear water. It's okay. And I had this moment then in the water at that time with this fish where I just couldn't believe that this was the life that I was living, that I, had, I was out in this beautiful place. I was looking face to face with this creature. I was filled with awe and I was filled with, with wonder. And I thought, this is an amazing kind of job that I get to do. But I didn't have a theological language. I didn't have a framework biblically 
to try to interpret that encounter in a way that would help me and point me more to God. Uh, I was a follower of Christ, um, was very active in, in university ministry, but ministry was over here, and then I went out and did my scuba diving and my marine conservation over here, and there really was no connection for me between the two areas. And so in a lot of ways, this journey that I've been on the last number of years since I came into contact with this group called Arasha, which is a Christian conservation organization, has been trying to think through what does it mean to do marine science for God's glory? Um, not just doing good work, um, but, but actually thinking about it in a way that really takes the Bible very seriously and takes the science very seriously. So what I'd like to do tonight is bring you a little bit on that journey um, I want to just start thinking through a little bit of the scripture. Um, so here's just sort of a, a, a title here, um, Hope for the Ocean. Um, another title would be Biodiversity and the Glory of God. Um, and thinking through what does the scripture say that, uh, at least for me, really connected those two areas of my life, my desire to, to care for God's world, and also my desire to serve him and live for his glory. So we're gonna focus a little bit initially on some scripture, um, and then I wanna go into a very specific um, area uh, that's, that um, will help us to understand what does it mean practically then, and what, what can we do actually as followers of Christ who want to be a part of taking care of God's world in a way that, that honors him, that glorifies him, um, and is true to the scripture. So for, for me, one of the most basic fundamental truths um, that I find in the scripture is that it's God's world and, and not mine. Um, we see in the beginning, God created. Uh, and this wasn't in the beginning, Bob created. <laughs> you know, we're not, as much as we think uh, we have, have power, uh, the, God is, is the Almighty, and he's the one that created. And God said, it says in Genesis, that he saw it, and it was good. Um, so God declared the world around us good. And that should make us pause to think that the, the world itself has value, uh, because God says it does. So irrespective of what it does for us, or how nice it is, or how good it looks, or how much I enjoyed being in the water with that fish, um, my opinion on the matter, and my desires and the things that I like about the world are irre irrelevant in the sense that God created it and called it good. It's his world, he declared it good without reference to me. Um, and so we as followers then of God, for God declares something good, and, um, and then we also need to take that very, very seriously. So this is what some people will call a theocentric approach to conservation, so God-centered. Um, some of the, the ways in which often we can approach thinking about things are more what the term is anthropocentric, so human-centered. So a human-centered approach to, be, to conservation will be, what does it do for me? What is it, um, what value is for me? A God-centered approach starts with, in the beginning, God, and God saw that it was good. One of the more uh, important sets of verses uh, in the scripture that deals with creation care, one maybe you've never applied in that way, is Colossians 1. Um, this is a great passage about Christ and, and being the image of the invisible God. So it says, he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created through him and for him. And then verse 20, and through him, through Jesus, God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. So there's a number of things in there to pack, but again, it, it highlights that the world around us was created not for us, but for Jesus. 
So it was created through him and for him. We know from John 1.1, in the beginning was the word, that's Christ. He was there at that beginning, and it's through Christ. But in, and actually, in verse 16, says, and in him all things in heaven and earth were created. So you just get this beautiful picture of Christ as the source of creation, and, and, and he's the one for whom it was made. Um, so it was, it, the earth is not the stage in which we play out our life. Um, it's, it's the stage in which God uh, shows his glory and which is created for God's glory and for his praise. And interestingly, too, in verse 20 there, it talks about God was pleased through Christ to reconcile to himself all things. So everything that was broken at the fall is fixed at the cross. And we see at the fall what broke. Our relationship with God broke. Our relationship with each other broke. Creation itself broke. You know, we know that thorns came and all that. And, and also our, our relationship with ourself broke. Our internal mental and physical health broke. And so all of those things, if Christ's work on the cross is all sufficient and fixes everything that was broken in the world, that also means then that the cross, this all things, applies to the world around us. And so in, in the same way that um, the cross is the ultimate and final solution for our personal relationship with God, that actually all the things that are broken in our world are fixed through Christ's blood on the cross. So any Christian view of creation care or conservation has to focus on being Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection at the cross, as being the center of our hope and of our work. We also see from many places, but I'm just picking out one of the Psalms here, that the purpose, again, of creation is God's praise and his glory. So we see this Psalm 148, uh, just verses 7 to 12. Praise the Lord from the earth. You sea monsters in all deeps, fire and hail, snow and frost, stormy wind fulfilling his command, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and women alike, old and young together. It's a beautiful picture of both the inanimate creation, the storms, the fire, the hail, the frost of, of our animate creation, wild animals, cattle, creeping things. Uh, it's great for the salamanders that are around here, all the creeping salamanders that I just heard about. And kings of the earth, princes and rulers, and everybody, young people, old people, uh, men and women alike. It's a beautiful symphony of praise to our God. And so this idea then is that the purpose of all creation is God's glory and his praise. And we'll see later then that what that means then is when it's destroyed, when it's ruined, when there's extinction, that's God's praise and glory being reduced in our planet. And it's, it's animals then that are meant to praise God that don't anymore. Um, what, what does it actually mean that, that the creeping things are, are praising God? Uh, as a marine biologist, I think about crabs, you know, and there's these things called fiddler crabs. Uh, there's also ghost crabs. They wander around the beach. They got little claws. And so I sort of picture, you know, what is it, how does a crab praise God? Well, it's, it's by being a crab in all its crabbiness. Uh, you know, so that animal functioning how it's supposed to function, how God intended that animal to function, by doing that and being in that way, that animal is giving glory to God, is praising God. Um, and so when we, again, when we do things then that, that help, that make the, so that the crab can't do that, can't live in a way a crab is supposed to live, that's God's praise reduced on our, on our planet. And we'll see how we're doing that in a little bit. And it's not just now. Um, you know, I was very involved um, over many years with, with living overseas and being and helping uh, people who had never uh, heard about Christ to hear. And so, very committed to uh, verse, verses in Revelation 5:9 about every nation, every tribe, every tongue 
before God's throne praising him. And I was really, really surprised to keep reading a few verses later. And so just in Revelation 5.13, it goes on to say, after it's said this amazing verses about all the nations before the throne, it says, Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them singing, to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. So heaven itself is going to be more like a, a big zoo or a wildlife park uh, than sometimes we may think it is. Uh, we see here, again, I'm not suggesting that animals have a soul and get saved and, and go to heaven. Please don't misunderstand. But whatever scripture means here about all of these creatures be, being before the throne of God, praising him and singing, the animals are there with us. Uh, and it makes sense if we've got a creator God who created all this stuff that was meant to praise him, that, that everything that he created good, declared good, that Christ died on the cross to fix is going to be there in the new creation. So I was very, very surprised as I began to study the scripture and read a number of these things. And we could go kind of on and on, and, and so I would encourage you, uh, like hopefully everybody who teaches the Bible does, to don't just believe me, but study the scripture yourself, to go and take a look as, as you read the scripture and see all the places where, where God's heart for all of creation is there. I mean, you can think of Noah's Ark, for example. It wasn't just people in the boat. Um, and God actually made his covenant with all the creation, not just with Noah and his family. So it, it, the list kind of goes on and on, uh, which is very surprising to me. And yet, in spite of all this, creation groans. Uh, we know from Romans, the famous passage, creation's groaning and waiting for the sons of God to be revealed. So we have a part then in helping to fix creation. In the same way Christ on the cross fixed uh, made it possible for everyone to have a relationship with him, and yet he still asks us to be a part of that, to be a part of helping people to, to come to know Christ. In the same way that creation was fixed uh, at the cross, there's still a process that has to be gone through to be a part of that, what Colossians calls the, the reconciling all things in Christ. We see later in, in Paul's writing that we've been given the ministry of reconciliation, so we're a part of that. And yet we, we know that uh, around us creation is groaning. Um, we see that uh, in our day-to-day -day lives, but also uh, in the different things that are going on around in the world. Uh, for example, every year uh, 100 million sharks are killed every year for either for their fins or for their food. Um, the area that I live in in Florida is one of the most, uh, it's the highest percentage of shark bites in the world. And, um, and so when we go swimming, we're always a little bit watching out for a shark, but there's really almost no chance of me actually getting bit. Um, yet if you're a shark out in the ocean, there's a very good chance you're gonna get caught and get your fins cut off and end up in soup somewhere. Um, and so creation groans. There's extinctions on land and sea. Um, every year there's different species going extinct. Um, and so we can think of things like in the past, we know about the dodo. There was a seal that lived in the Caribbean. Um, there was a big sea cow, the, a manatee that lived up near Alaska um, that went extinct a couple hundred years ago. So those voices and that choir of creation have gone out. They're no longer, the dodo can no longer praise God uh, on our planet. And so his world, God's world, that made for his glory is groaning. And Romans suggests that we then have a part in that, um, in, in helping the reconciliation of all things and bringing things to the point where there's healing uh, and that's really the work of conservation. And so one thing that I'm very excited about then is that as Christians, we love God, or we, we care for the world around us out of our love for God and also our concern for his glory and love for our neighbors around us. But the interesting thing is that in this case, science actually points us the way to do that. And so we know from conservation science 
how to help animals not go extinct, how to protect fish populations. We know and we have learned ways in which we can care uh, for these different populations. So science then in the service of helping us to love our neighbor, to glorify God, and obey his commands to care for his world. What I'd like to do is um, use a very specific example, um, that of plastic pollution, uh, as a way to think about some of these verses, uh, to think about some of the ways in which creation's groaning, and also look at some of the ways that uh, at least our organization and other Christians around the world have tried to care for God's world uh, in this very specific kind of area. Um, you know, why, why talk about plastic? Um, well, again, it, it has impacts on biodiversity. Um, we often unknowingly destroy God's world um, and, and his glory on, this, on the planet. <clears throat> This was a beach in the Bahamas, and I was helping a group from Michigan, a kind of a youth group, youth mission trip. And, you know, we did some of the normal things that you do on youth mission trips, but we also spent uh, an afternoon cleaning up this beach. And, and you'd think this is sort of a remote area in the Bahamas, you know, people weren't littering there. We picked up 65 big rubbish bags full of, full of plastic from that beach just in a few hours. And so the garbage bags were just, you know, all over the place full, full of plastic. And so then, you know, we know scripturally, this was an area of beauty that's meant to glorify God. And yet people had, in this case, most of it had been thrown somewhere else and washed up on the shores of the Bahamas and had, had taken a place that was meant to take your breath away to point you to God and, it, and you had to step over the rubbish and make sure you weren't you know, cutting your feet on glass. So God's, God's glory, the, 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 the function of that place was diminished. And this is something that plastic does. So we have a, a program that we call uh, an ocean of plastic. And then what we're trying to do, you saw the first slide, the title is an ocean of hope. So what we're trying to do is re replace an ocean of plastic with an ocean of hope. When I was um, uh, first out of graduate school and, and working in a little, tiny little islands near India called the Maldive Islands, um, we weren't really thinking about this problem. This was kind of the early 1990s. And we were you know, on, on beaches, there were beautiful beaches, and really I don't remember plastic washing up on those beaches. Our problems were um, very different at that time. Now, if, you, if you've seen some of these kinds of photos, this is a river um, in Indonesia, I think it is, and you know, the whole areas are just choked with plastic. Uh, I was just, uh, last night, we were, uh, my son and I picked him up from school and we went out, there's a national seashore um, near where I live in Florida, near the Space Center. And so it's totally undeveloped, but the way, you know, waves were crashing and we kind of got out in the waves and we're a little bit like a washing machine, but um, you come out and washing up, all, you know, so nobody's out there littering, but washing up from the ocean is plastic bottle caps is, you know, bottles is plastic. And so even if um, we ourselves are not creating the problem, um, the ocean doesn't really divide us. It actually, um, it, it um, connects us. And so what, what goes into the ocean in one place connects us to another place. So it's an opportunity to love your neighbor or actually do something that's not going to love your neighbor. Um, and so, and, and, you know, I noticed the mission board out here, and it's, a, it's obviously a church that cares about people both near and far. And so easily, by our plastic consumption and use, you know, you can, you can be impacting people on the other side of the world. Our own plastic use has kind of skyrocketed. This is only up to 2015. Um, so if you look at this graph, um, you see that the average 
consumption in gallons of bottled water in the U.S., this was 2015, is about 36 and a half gallons. So that's approximately 146 liter, you know, or quart water bottles per person per year. Um, so if the U.S. population is about 325 million people, at that time that means there were 47 and a half billion water bottles every year that's used. And each of these water bottles, um, as far as we can tell, the research, uh, where's the water bottle? Plastic bottle takes about 450 years to um, completely kind of break down. And the problem is what we're finding is, is these kind of bottles, you know, end up out in the ocean. And so this is, again, the beach uh, near our house. And you see, I think in, on one day, I would spend about 10 minutes picking up about 100 of these bottle caps on our beach in this national park. Um, you can see here, uh, there's my one last bottle, uh, which is meant to, to remind people to, to you know, use one less water bottle and to use this reusable. But there's stuff that just is washed up on these beaches all over the place. Um, and again, you know, this is, these are extreme examples, of course, but someone here who, you know, just hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands of water bottles. And we can talk about recycling, but often our recycling has been shipped to those other areas of the world. So recently, um, a lot of our uh, recycling was being shipped to China. And so we were just sort of, rather than us actually dealing with our problem, we were just giving it to someone else. Um, and they've stopped taking it because there was too much and there's, they stopped being able to do something with it. And so a lot of places around the world, um, you know, we've been a part of making their lives more difficult. And one of the things that happens though with plastic is that it doesn't just go away. It breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces. Um, so if you see in this picture here, um, you'll see little bits of plastic along the beach. And I'm going to pass around some microplastics here. But the reality is that most of us in this room will never again experience a beach without plastic on it in some form. Uh, and particularly, a lot of these plastics break down into smaller pieces um, and they form these microplastics. Um, all plastic starts off as these nurdles, so that jar there with the little pellets. Um, those pellets are made um, and then shipped around the world, and then everything that's plastic is sort of uses that plastic, is, is melted, and makes um, this laptop and makes, you know, this, anything that you have as plastic started off as one of those nurdles, usually. And so these, uh, here's a close up. These get out into the, to the ocean, so they're shipped maybe by a container on a boat, and one of them drops off, and, and then all of these plastic pieces get out there. Or sometimes in a factory, they're used to make things, and you know, they spill all over the place, and they're just sort of swept down a drain and end up out in a river and then out in the sea. Um, some other times, types of microplastics that are uh, made, you, you, I think it's now, or soon to be illegal if it isn't now, but without us knowing, the industry switched uh, what was abrasive in our toothpaste from natural things to plastic. And so these are plastic microbeads, so they're, they're made really, really, really small, and um, just started doing it, didn't ask us whether we wanted plastic to brush our teeth. Um, but it saved them money, and so, you know, they do with that. Um, and so we, you know, plastic has just pervaded every sort of area of our, of our life. And so these microbeads, you can see in this uh, sort of diagram here, you know, that you, you brush your teeth, it goes down the sink, all those microbeads, are, even if you have tertiary water uh, filtering, like in a, in a waste sanitation place, those beads are sm so small that it goes right through and then gets out into the river and then out into the ocean. 
So it's everywhere that we've looked, sorry, I'm painting a very dire picture here, but it is actually quite dire. Um, every habitat we've looked in, every species we've looked in, every place we've looked, there's plastic. It's in the air, you know, it's in your tap water, it's in your bottled water. Um, and we don't know what the results are for our health. Um, we do know that it's impacting, uh, especially some of the, the animals that feed kind of out in the ocean. Maybe you've seen the pictures of the seabirds. I don't want to put a bunch of gruesome wildlife pictures of, of animals dying up before us. Um, but we, we do don't know what it's doing to us. Now, I do want to just be very careful to point out that there are good ways of using plastic. I mean, this is a creative way. Someone made a, a house out of old plastic bottles. Um, there's art. Uh, in your cars, you know, that reduces the weight. Um, and things that are going to last for, for 20, 50 years, there, there are good uses of plastic. So please don't misunderstand me on that, that all plastic is bad. Um, but a lot of the single-use plastic and a lot of the things that we use once and just throw away. I forget the exact number, but I think the average plastic bag from a supermarket is you know, used for just a few minutes, if that, and then is gone and, and only used once um, and, and never again. And then it lasts for hundreds of years and breaks up into small pieces and so on and so forth. So we do, we do want to keep, keep in mind, again, switching back now to thinking about loving God and loving our neighbor. You know, little kids like this shouldn't grow up in a place where they're, they're walking across and trying to avoid all this plastic pollution. And so it does, it does impact not only the, the biodiversity, so there's good evidence for a lot of species that they're killed, individuals that are killed by plastic pollution, but also we find that plastic pollution is impacting um, uh, some of the chemistry that's going on in the seawater. So these plastics, they actually absorb toxins and then float around and spread those toxins um, there's still no uh, smoking gun, so to speak, no link to human uh, health, but all of the stuff that we're eating uh, has plastic in it, and so we just really don't know yet what it's potentially doing to our own, own health. Um, but I think from a, if we think about it again, trying to link back to, to some of our scriptures, you know, we saw in the Psalms in particular how there's sort of this order to, to the way creation worked together. And so, you know, you see that certain, an, God, Psalm 104 talks about God giving the food to the animals, and you see about certain animals eating other animals. And we know that in nature there's this uh, cycle that, that God doesn't do waste. Everything is used. Uh, and so the things that break down other things eat. And so out of, out of death, God brings amazing diversity and life. Uh, so we see that when a, you know, a seed has to fall to the ground to, to, to grow into something beautiful, and you know, an, an animal dies of a natural death, there's lots and lots of creatures then that are utilizing that animal. And, and then it breaks down and then into mushrooms and then you know, another animal eats that. So we see God's plan as one of, of, of recycling, if you want to call it that, of materials, of, of, of beauty and diversity coming out of um, this process of death. But plastic, in a way, the way we've designed it is actually stops that. It subverts that order. So we've designed it not to break down. And so then an animal that you know, would normally eat something and it would go through their system and they would use it to make energy and little animals. Uh, you know, plastic then gets stuck in their system and they can't, you know, and they eventually can't eat anymore because they can't digest that plastic. So it subverts the order and the recycling that, that God actually um, created. 
The other thing that we, I think, where plastic fits in is, is that there really becomes very little places in our world that are wilderness, where there's places, you know, where we can go and be in an area where we don't, where we basically just see God uh, through, his, through his creation. And so if you're always going to a place and every beach you go to has plastic on it, um, this idea of wilderness in scripture, a place to get away from the things of the sort of, of our human society, uh, not because those things are necessarily all bad, but it's just you need to pull away. We see that, you know, Moses went off in the wilderness, Jesus went off in the wilderness. And so if we're creating a world where there's no more wilderness, because our fingerprints in the form of plastic are on everything, it makes it that much more difficult. I mean, God can still meet us. He meets us here. You know, we don't have to go to the wilderness to, to meet God. But it's a, it's a way of meeting God that now we're beginning more and more to close off and not be able to meet him in that special way that he seems to work uh, in those, those desert places and those wilderness kinds of places. And so through the ocean, as a connector, you know, the things that we do here are, are going everywhere. And so you end up on these remote Pacific islands out in the middle of nowhere, and they're full of plastic, you know, that obviously wasn't, wasn't created there. Um, and I do think as well that this idea of, of loving your neighbor is a really important one for us to understand as Christians. That the things that we're doing in this place and at this time um, end up impacting someone else. And that can either be an impact for good or an impact for bad. And so, um, you know, a, a simple example of a, in terms of, I don't, because I'm a marine biologist, I'm always thinking of the ocean. But, you know, if you think about island communities, you know, that throwing some rubbish into the water, it's going to float away. Um, so, but it goes off somewhere and uh, it impacts someone else. So that's not loving to that neighbor. Um, you could think about it in your own, your own circumstance about the food that you buy, that you're on the chain on the end of a chain of blessing or a chain of cursing. So, you know, you pick your, you know, your can of tuna, say, um, that comes from somewhere. And that was, if you follow that chain back, it, it ends in some fisherman on some place out in the, you know, somewhere in the world that may or may not know Christ, that may or may not um, be making a good living. You know, there's a lot of evidence that in uh, some of the fishing communities, there's a lot of people who are forced into fishing and it's kind of a modern day form of slavery. Um, and so some of those products are ending up on our shelf. And we can't look at every little thing, you know, you just can't live that way. But we have to be aware that actually how the things that we buy the, 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 in the store and the clothes that we wear, they are on the end of a chain. And that chain can be something that's really used for good or something that's, that's used for bad. And so we do want to be aware consumers uh, in this whole area. Because ultimately then, we want our lives to, to not only uh, in the sort of immediate uh, circumstances of our lives, but in, in the way that we influence the rest of the world to be living in a way that glorifies God, that brings his praise, that helps creation to praise God, um, and that helps the world, helps be a part of that reconciling of all things to Christ. One of the things that we've um, developed in, in um, Arasha is a microplastics toolbox. So if some of these things have um, given you interest, you know, then I would suggest you go to our website. I'll have a sign-up sheet later, but it's at, at arasha.org. There's a toolbox that has some tools to help you understand some of the science behind microplastics. There's fact sheets. On, um, on some of these things. There's a whole theology section. So there's a Bible study and what does the Bible say about plastic uh, and some prayers. 
And um, some issues of lifestyle, you know, what are some of the things that you could do actually to reduce your plastic use? Some educational tools and some media tools, some good YouTube videos. So uh, I would encourage you that if, if you want to get more involved or just think more about this issue, that you could use that toolbox to both think about the science and the faith aspects of things. The other thing that, that, that we're trying to do, uh, where I'm living currently, is in Titusville, Florida, which is sort of near the Space Center um, east of Orlando. Uh, so if you've ever been to Disney, you're kind of close uh, to our area. It's an area of Florida that I didn't know and that um, is really quite uh, beautiful. This is sort of the, the um, entrance way to one of the beaches. And one of the things that we've been trying to do is give practical ways for people to, to implement their Christian faith by making God's world a more beautiful place and cleaning up plastic. So this is uh, our pastor's wife out on one of our beach cleans. And um, it, you know, the beach is actually was, was relatively clean, but we were still able to find um, a bunch of plastic. So I'd encourage you, you were decent ways from the ocean, so, but maybe in the summer you can get out there and, and clean. But actually, our watershed folks, you know, everything that ends up um, in, in the water is going to ultimately end up in, in the ocean. And so I do think there are lots of, there's rivers and around here that you could be involved in, in keeping clean. And I think that the key to me, or not the key, that the opportunity is to see this as worship of God. You know, it's not worship of the place, we're not worshiping the earth or its animals, but actually as an act of worship by helping God's world to be more beautiful, to praise God. It's actually not just a civic duty, it's not just something that, um, you know, we ought to do because, you know, we're, our environment's bad or, you know, however you want to frame it. It's actually an opportunity to love God and love our neighbor in a very practical sort of way. And making that, that kind of connection to your faith can maybe transform that, that uh, experience into something that really connects you to God. The other thing that you can do, um, this is a picture again of this nurdle, and um, you saw the jar back there. In this microplastics toolbox, there's actually a worldwide movement of people that search for these nurdles. And um, they're in our toolbox. Uh, you'd be surprised how addictive it is. Now the problem is I can't walk down on a beach without looking for a nurdle, and I'm trying to find them. And so, but what you can do is take part in a citizen science project that's global. Uh, so there is uh, something called the Great Nurdle Hunt. And uh, there's actually a big one coming in March where, where people around the world are going out within a certain week in the middle of March and searching around. And this would be in rivers too. We find them in the Great Lakes, for example. Uh, anywhere there's plastic manufacturing, uh, you might find these nurdles. Um, and so you just go out and you're basically, it's a time on the, uh, on the beach or by the river, by the lake, searching for these specific kinds of things. And then there's a, a website you can go to and you put in your information, where you found them and how many and how long you searched. And then people around the world, all of that's collated and you can see your, your little dot then on the map and um, be able to, then scientists are looking at that and trying to understand where this microplastic is coming from and where it's going. So you can participate in this kind of global science project. Uh, one of the other things that we've been doing, we have a, a partnership with um, a number of different universities, and this is one of the university students down on the beach uh, here in Florida, and doing uh, microplastic surveys. So it's a more technical kind of survey for for university students who are going into the environment. So if you know someone who is maybe going into this area, wants an experience of, of trying to understand microplastic pollution, we'd love to, to have uh, you down in Florida and, and join us for some of these surveys, either on a, as a formal kind of intern or as just to come down. If you're in, in Disney and want to get away from the mouse for a couple, for a day, 
uh, come over and, and see us, and we'd love to, to take you out and show you some of these places. So what we're really trying to do then, as I mentioned, is out of our love for God, our love for our neighbor, out of trying to glorify God, uh, turn an ocean of plastic into an ocean of hope. And that hope is, is really found, of course, ultimately in Christ. And we care about this plastic pollution because of our love for God, our neighbors, and ourselves. Um, Christ is the solution to the problem. We see in him all things are reconciled. Our hope is in Christ. And it's an exciting, um, I think, project because it shows how the science helps us to do that better. Uh, we wouldn't know that these things were a problem. We wouldn't know that we're not loving our neighbor uh, by the things that we're doing if the science didn't show us that. And I think, too, one of the big problems with plastic pollution is it's about convenience, it's about ease, um, it's about um, trying to just use something and get rid of it. And this whole cycle of consumerism is something that, that really, I think, mitigates against, fights against this um, life in Christ that, that Jesus called the abundant life. Um, we think we're having an abundance of stuff, and that makes everything great, and that's the abundant life. But actually, it's, I think, causing us to, to want more. It's causing us to always think about what we don't have. It's causing us to value convenience over value. And I think it's actually making God's world a less beautiful place. And so I think if we do truly want to live an abundant life for Christ, that this is an area where we can actually really make a difference. Uh, and so in closing, and then there'll be um, some time for questions, I just want to say Arasha isn't just about the ocean and just about plastic, and we work in a lot of places. This is, uh, and I would encourage you to go to our website and take a look. There's lots of different ways, creative ways, to, to love God and your neighbor and care for God's world. This is a project in Uganda where we're um, helping with clean water systems. Um, uh, the link is actually to a, a wetland that's really important for migrating birds. And there's some of God's rarest and most you know, incredibly beautiful birds in this marsh. And people are, are collecting wood and draining the marsh to be able to cook and to be able to boil water so that they don't get sick drinking their water. So one of the ways to help protect the marsh and to love people and provide clean water is these biosand filters. So it's, you know, one of these win-wins and really loving people and place. Uh, we have a lot of centers around the world. Um, Cassie, who's here, was at our center in Kenya. And so uh, a beautiful place on the beach there. Um, but also there's places in Canada, uh, in Europe, and these are places where you can come and really experience in community what it, what it means to try to live out your Christian faith and care for the world around us. Some of the stuff that they do in Canada is particularly focused on community gardening, for example. So there's a lot of diversity and we work kind of all around the world, the numbers of the different projects we have in, in those kinds of places. So I'd encourage you just to, to take a look um, and there's a, be a sign-up sheet here if you want to receive our, our, our newsletter. Um, so, yeah, I will finish there. Uh, there's the, the website. And just wanted to, again, finish with, um, this is such a, for those of you maybe who are already caring um, about the environment, um, maybe this helps you connect it a little more into your faith. For those who are maybe a little skeptical that what does this have to do with God anyway, I hope I've at least raised some questions and will encourage you to go to the Bible yourself um, and look and see what the Bible has to say and um, looking forward to, to trying to answer your questions and, and we can discuss together. So thank you. <laughs>